Is it possible to believe in God and still be a scientist? And as a scientist, you know, can you take the word of God uh, uh, or the Bible as the word of God? Uh, and these are questions which we hope to answer this morning. Uh, but let me start by giving you a, a, a brief uh, introduction about my background. It, it was a long time ago that I finished a degree in biochemistry and microbiology, and that was followed by a, a, a PhD in molecular genetics. Uh, and throughout my career, uh, I've used my scientific training. Uh, I first of all started of being a molecular biologist, which which actually meant cloning and expressing human genes. I'm not going to be talking about that this morning. I'm sure you'd be pleased to know. Um, and since then, um, I've been, well, certainly more recently, I've been the, the manager, the project manager of drug develop, discovery and development projects, uh, generating new medicines for cancer. So throughout all of my career, I have used my scientific training to do my job effectively. On top of that, I can say that I am a committed believer in the Bible as the word of God. And obviously, I believe that God exists. So let's have a think about the introduction or the, the talk outline this morning. What we're going to do is give some answers to atheists at the beginning, very shortly. Um, we're also going to look at how the Bible and science can be used to understand different questions. And we're going to see that faith in God is not blind, but is based on evidence. And then we're going to look at the assertion that evolution explains the origin of life, uh, which it clearly doesn't. And then we're going to look at other evidence for God um, and in the fine-tuned universe and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So let's just start um, with this. There are people, atheists, um, Richard Dawkins is, is key amongst them, and, and he certainly objects to the very idea of God. He is an atheist. He is against God. He believes that there is no God. And he's been quoted as saying that belief in God is akin to believing in fairies. Uh, and this is what he said. Isn't it enough to see that a garden is beautiful without having to believe that there are fairies at the bottom of it? And he's basically saying that just because something is beautiful, you don't have to believe that God uh, made it so. And, and he's actually providing false alternatives. Um, in this example of the beautiful garden, he's providing the option of fairies or nothing. You either believe in fairies or, or not, but he doesn't provide the explanation of why the garden is beautiful. You know, fairies are clearly a delusion, but all beautiful gardens have an owner or a gardener. And typically, they are the ones responsible for designing the layout of the garden, for planting the plants in the specific places, and making the garden beautiful by tending it and caring for it and fertilizing it. So he's using this idea of false alternatives. It's either fairies or nothing in his example, but he's obviously saying that it's like believing in fairies. And of course, that's nonsense. It isn't like that at all. You see, quite frequently within the media, we hear statements like belief in God and scientific method aren't compatible. Now, this is patently, blatantly not true. OK, um, I've been working in science for the whole of my career, 30 years or 33 years now, um, and I've met many people who are Christians in their faith. Um, I like myself. Um, it didn't stop them from being very good scientists. And uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who is a, a, a very famous evolutionist, said, and unless at least half my colleagues are dunces, there can be on the most raw and empirical grounds no conflict between science and religion. So um, he basically was saying, you can believe in God and still be a scientist. OK, so, so we, we, we've debunked that myth. You can believe in God and still be a scientist. But why is belief in God opposed? And why do we you know, frequently hear in the media constant attacks on those who believe in God from so-called scientists? Well, it's clear there are two reasons. It's clear that the first one is that um, people like Richard Dawkins are promoting an atheistic agenda. 
they do not believe in God. And he is an evangelist, if you like, for atheism. He is promoting atheism. He wants other people to have the same belief as him. His belief is that there is no God. So he's openly promoting that. And secondly, a belief in God is opposed by scientists or some scientists because uh, of philosophy or the philosophy of science, because modern science promotes naturalism. Now, what I mean by that is that uh, they say that nature is all that there is, that there can be no outside supernatural influence, that all naturalistic phenomena must be considered mindless, non-deliberate or random. Uh, and we're going to actually look at that um, that suggestion um, because I don't think that's necessarily true. It's often a very good starting point from a scientific pers perspective to try and understand how something works. But you you have to go where the evidence leads because science is not natu naturalism. So what is science? Um, science can be quite difficult to define. Um, I've sort of put out an explanation here of, as the way I see it. Scientists, they make observations, and based on those observations, they'll, they'll generate an assumption to try and explain the, the thing that they've seen. Um, and then the assumptions are tested by experiments. And then the proven assumption becomes a theory. Now, further testing may provide even more confidence in the theory, so that becomes a law. Now, I, I learned at school uh, during physics about the law of or the laws of gravity. Um, and I also learned about Boyle's law, which was um, to, to do with gases. Uh, and both of those, you know, when we had lessons on gravity and lessons on uh, Boyle's law and, and, and that you could do experiments to prove that, um, you know, the laws were true. Uh, and we did. And they were. Um, but scientists sometimes study things which are very difficult to repeat. Um, for example, how do you repeat the origin of the universe? Okay, so it's impossible to do that. So you can't run an experiment. Oh, let's let's just um, rerun the origin of of the universe. So what they have to do in that circumstance is to take the current available evidence that they see in the universe right now, and then extrapolate back. That's all that they can do. Um, they, you know, however, science should always show a willingness, true science should, should show a willingness to follow the empirical evidence wherever it leads. Okay, so we've, we've, we've started that, that sort of debunked a couple of myths, but there's a few things that science can't answer. Science can't answer questions like why? Why is there a universe? Why are we here? Um, what was before the Big Bang? If, if, if the universe was started um, with the Big Bang, you know, what happened before that? What, what, how did, you know, what was there? And they, they just cannot answer that. Um, it claims to answer many things, but it can't answer questions like this. Let me give an explanation of what I mean by that. Um, uh, there's a nice piece of, or there's a nice cake there. It's um, a picture of a Victoria sponge, um, and I'm sure I'm making you all think, oh, I might, wouldn't fancy, might fancy a piece of that, certainly a slice of that. I personally would myself, um, and uh, it looks very nice. Now, what a scientist can do is a scientist can um, use all of their um, mass spec and all sorts of uh, different techniques to analyse the cake. Um, also, they could use existing knowledge. Um, they would say, well, a Victoria sponge is normally made out of, is it uh, flour, uh, sugar, eggs and butter, you know, to make the sponge um, in a particular recipe. But what they could also do is analyze, you know, the components of that sponge to look at the molecular makeup, how the proteins are interacting. The proteins from the eggs are interacting with the um, carbohydrates from the flour. They might even be able to detect a trace element of salt in there from the butter because it was salted butter that was put in. And they might even be able to detect some bicarbonate of soda in there because it was self-raising flour that was actually used. Uh, and they might look at the jam and say, right, well, there's this ratio of sucrose to raspberries, okay, because we can analyze that. 
And so they can tell us all sorts of interesting things about the cake. They could even say, well, based on what we can see, we'll, we'll repeat this and make our own cake. This is how it was made. Okay. So we all understand that. But they can't tell us why the cake was made. Why this particular cake was made. And, and the reason is that it was made by Aunt Matilda because her nephew Johnny was coming for tea that day. So it's very clear that science can't answer the why questions. It can answer many of the what questions and potentially the how questions. And, and what we have, we have the Bible, which explains the why questions, why we're here and what God's purpose is with us. And so what I'm saying is that the Bible and science should be compatible. They're not answering the same questions. They're answering different questions because uh, the Bible is not a scientific textbook. It doesn't give uh, the precise information about how things were made apart from by the word of God, by the power of God. It doesn't talk about the precise molecular makeup of, you know, living things. Is more concerned about why we are here and what God's plan and purpose is uh, with the world. So the two can be used together, science and the Bible. Now, Professor Richard Dawkins, obviously he's very prominent in, in his attacks against uh, religion, has uh, made lots of attacks about people who believe in God. And um, he's quoted as saying this, I'm against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. Now, again, this is a manifestly false statement. There in history have been many very religious men in the past who have striven to understand more about the world and the universe. People like Galileo, who, di who discovered that the planets actually go around the sun. Uh, people like Sir Isaac Newton, who we've already mentioned the laws of gravity, uh, defined the laws of gravity. I'm not going to say he invented it um, because gravity is gravity. But the fact is that um, he was a very, very religious man. Galileo um, was um, a Roman Catholic priest. So it, it's very clear that religious people are um, interested and um, uh, striving to understand more about the world. Um, they were, it, you know, being a, a religious person, a person of faith doesn't make us less inquisitive. Uh, and Richard Dawkins has also said this, faith is a great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is the belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. Well, once again, this is not true. My faith is not based on a lack of evidence. Uh, my faith is not blind. It's based on evidence. And so I'm here to tell you, you know, many of the reasons why I believe in God. Now, some of these reasons might be dismissed by atheists, but nonetheless, the evidence here co convinces me that God exists. So the first line of evidence that I've outlined and is uh, Bible evidence, the fact that we have fulfilled Bible prophecy. God, um, through his prophets, made uh, prophecies uh, that, that certain events were going to happen and they happened to the letter. We have undesigned coincidences in, in the Bible, which proves to us the veracity of the writings of each of the individual uh, teachers, uh, that it is a true historical record. Uh, and of course, it correlates with the archaeological findings that are there in the Middle East. And um, we know that the Bible is a book ahead of its time in terms of the health and welfare laws and hygiene laws. Um, it presents its heroes, unlike any other book, warts and all. So the Bible is full of evidence uh, that it is God's word to us. But we also have the uh, witness of the Jews. Now, this certainly convinces me. And, and as, a, as, a, as a lad, I was really interested in this subject when I realized that nation like the Jews or the, uh, the nation of the Jews had been scattered from their original homeland for nearly 2000 years. 
but they had maintained their national integrity, if you like, or retained their national, you know, their, their their individuality as Jews. And of course, in 1948, a national homeland for the Jews was re-established in the original land, the land of Israel. And they are witnesses that God exists. You know, I I used to love history and I always think, well, where are the Normans? Where are the Saxons? Where are the Celts? You know, wh where are the people, the original uh, Angles? You know, where, where are the, the, the people that originally ha inhabited this land? And of course, well, we're all amalgamated together, aren't we? Um, into one British nation. Um, you know, so so many, many of those original nations have been amalgamated together, but not the Jews. The Jews remain God's witnesses. There's moral evidence. Um, not going to dwell much on this, but the fact that every single society across the world in human society um, has um, right and wrong. The, everyone is born with a conscience. Um, we, we can talk more about that, but we're going to leave that for now. There are many people whose personal experiences have, have, have convinced them that God exists because they felt that God has been working in their lives. And there is the evidence from life. We look at nature around us. Um, we mentioned about the beauty of nature early on. But let's just have a little think about that. I'm going to think about a bit more about that because... Richard Dawkins says that evolution explains life's origin. And remember, he's coming from this worldview of naturalism that nature is all there is. And he sees evolution as doing away with the need for God. But does evolution explain the existence of life? This is what he says. Natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process that Darwin discovered – and which we now know, this is what he's asserting, which we know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life. So he's claiming that natural selection is the reason, is the cause um, for life. Now, what does natural selection, what is natural selection, uh, that, that particular theory of evolution? Well, it's outlined as a random process, process which claims that one organism evolved from another, which, which evolved from something else, which evolved from something else, which evolved from, which evolved from something, all the way down over billions of years to the very first living cell, the simplest form of life. So how did the first form of life come into existence, if their theory is correct? Can evolution, can this process of natural selection cause the non-living to become living? Because that's what he's actually saying. Well, let's just have a examine that. Um, I don't know uh, how many in the audience will recognize this, uh, this picture. Um, this is a picture of an iPhone 15. Okay, it's the latest iPhone. Um, it can, now, it's, it's a remarkable uh, piece of engineering. It can sense the environment, okay, because um, to actually get into the iPhone, um, it looks at the owner um, and it says, okay, you're the owner, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you actually use me, okay? It's, it's actually, you know, it's got a camera that will do that and software that recognises the owner's face and allows access to the phone. It's got a microphone that detects voices and commands. Um, it's obviously got a touch screen as well so that you can actually uh, ask it to do various things and it will recognise that touch on the outside. It's got... This tough exterior, um, they're not that tough, obviously. If you hit it with a hammer, it's going to break. Uh, and I, I just uh, replaced the um, screen protector on my phone uh, earlier this week. Uh, but the fact is, it's pretty tough. Uh, it needs to be because lots of people drop their phones. Um, it's got this really complex internal hardware, which is doing what, you know, it's been programmed to do. And it's got a rechargeable power source. 
okay because you know we can plug it in and it will recharge it so it's using energy uh, from the battery and it's got the internal software and of course an iphone wouldn't be an iphone without that software which enables all of the internal components to work and the software is in a code which is designed by software engineers now clearly the iphone is a, a marvel in design and engineering um you know, it, it's obviously been designed. It's obviously been engineered. Now, let's just look at the simplest form of life. Well, it too, this is a bacterium. It can sense the environment. It will respond to external stimuli. It has a tough exterior in the form of a membrane, which acts not just as a barrier, but also as a filter and as the skeleton for the cell. It has really complicated internal hardware. It has these enzymes, the, the biological catalysts that are carrying out the um, reactions, the actual machinery, if you like, inside a cell. And these are molecular machines. They literally are machines. Um, we have, uh, every cell has a rechargeable power source. Um, it can take some of the nutrients that come through, you know, filtered through uh, the outside of the membrane, um, and it can utilize that to make this power source called ATP. And they've got these, if you like, power packs inside every single cell called ATP synthase which is generating this ATP, the, the source of, it's like the electricity, if you like, for the cell. And every single cell has this throughout, you know, th you know throughout nature. Uh, and as, as well, of course, every single cell has its genetic code, the appropriate software to make it work. And it is impossible that that software, that genetic so software happened by chance. So let me just explain about that. So the cell's software code provides an instruction. So DNA is made of building blocks, which have these individual letters, um, and we just call them T, C, A, and G. It's, it's more complex than that, but honestly, we, we just call them T, C, A, and G. Um, and the order, the sequence of those T, C, A, and G letters is part of the translatable code. Now, um, and I've, I've just put some examples of what they actually translate to. So a sequence of three letters will translate to a particular building block of, of a protein, an amino acid. Now, so the precise sequence of those letters matters. It really does matter uh, because the code won't work otherwise. If the, if the letters are out of place, um, or a letter missing, then the, the code is broken. Uh, just like a software code is broken and the actual iPhone won't work. So there's also some code on the outside of each gene. Um, and, and that's in part, it's very important, the sequence of that, because that's important for switching on and switching off each particular gene. Now then, we're thinking about the simplest form of life. Okay, so let's think about that. But we're starting, before we get to the simplest form of life, let's just think about the simplest gene itself. So the simplest gene I'm suggesting will be a gene about um, 300 of these letters long. Okay, now to form by chance, you have to get the correct letter in each particular place along that 100 uh, sorry, 300 sequence, uh, sequence, you have to get the correct letter in two out of every three positions. Okay, you have to, otherwise it won't work. Okay, so you can calculate then the probability of the likelihood of that actually happening. And the overall chance mathematically of getting the, the right sequence across the um, 303 um, positions is one chance in 2.6 times 10 to the power of 120. Now, what that means is that there is one chance, not in a billion, which has nine zeros after it, but one chance in this big number with 120 
zeros after it. In other words, if I put, um, you know, if I use the text of the title of this slide and put a zero in there, the zeros would fill the whole of this slide. Okay, it's 120 zeros. Now, we need to put that into context. What scientists say is that the limit of a chance occurrence, it couldn't possibly happen by chance if it was a greater or less chance than this. They say is a one chance of one times 10 to the 50. So that's 10 with 50 zeros after it. So our number has got an extra 70 zeros after it. Okay. It is impossible that that gene sequence happened by chance, is what the scientists are saying. And that is for a very simple gene. Now, the simplest living cell has been found by experiment to have 473 genes. The simplest living cell. Now, some scientists say, well, Maybe we could, or maybe, you know, we, the, a cell could be slightly, you know, have fewer genes than that, maybe 300. Okay, let's assume it had 300 genes. Okay, we've already shown that the, the likelihood of one gene happening by chance is impossible, let alone 300 genes that would all have to work properly for the cell to live. It is impossible that life happened by chance. No matter how long you were given, no matter how many planets um, were, were trying to create life all at the same time, it is impossible that it happened by chance. The science tells us that. You see, the DNA that forms the software of every living cell provides non-random data. These are coded instructions the coded instructions are found in every cell, and it's impossible that it happened by chance. And this, to me, is you know convincing evidence that life on this earth was designed and created. God exists. Just as the designer for my iPhone exists and, and you know put the software in there, so does God exist. So both atheism and theism require belief. Now, Richard Dawkins has been quoted as saying this about the origin of life. Nobody knows how it happened, but somehow without violating the laws of physics and chemistry, a molecule arose that just happened to have the property of self-copying, a replicator. So he doesn't claim to know how it happened. He just said it must have done. It just did. Well, I think that takes belief to believe that. It takes faith. I believe in the Bible, which the opening word says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. And, and we can read the rest of Genesis chapter one and, say, and see how that God, it was through the word of God, the command of God, that all living things on earth was created. And I think it takes just as much faith uh, for Richard Dawkins to believe in what he believes, in fact, more faith than, uh, than what I believe, because I've already shown that it's impossible that life happened by chance. You see, faith in God is not blind, but it's based on evidence. And I've looked at these, the evidence from life. So let's just think about uh, the fine-tuned universe. Um, the existence of galaxies, stars, atoms, all depend on fundamental physical constants found uh, in certain laws. Now, I'm not a physicist. I'm not speaking from expertise here. Um, but the, this information is clearly right, okay? Um, we have things like the speed of light. We know what that is. It's 299,792, 458 metres per second. OK, that's the speed of light. Um, there's also things like the gravitational constant. There's Planck's constant, Planck mass energy, the ratio of electron to proton mass. Now, what scientists have shown that each constant has an astonishingly precise um, 
value. Now, I've put five of these particular constants in. There's, there's a list of more than 10. Okay. And what they've basically shown is that if any one of these constants was a tiny fraction different from what it actually is, then there could be no physical interactive life of any kind anywhere. There would be no stars. There would be no life, no planets, no chemistry. There would be no Earth. Okay? So it looks like the universe has been created to enable life to exist. So how do, you, how, how do people explain this? Well, um, people like Dawkins talk about physical necessity. The universe must be life permitting. We are here, therefore it already is. But the physicist has said that the values of these constants, uh, they, you know, they, they could have been different. The constraints are not determined by the laws of nature. And they would say that a life prohibiting universe would actually be more likely, much more likely, than a life-permitting universe. So physical necessity doesn't stand up to, to the uh, interrogation. And then people say, well, we just got really, 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 really lucky then. And of course, no, that can't be the case because every single one of those constants needs to be the right figure. And if only one of them was wrong or different, then there wouldn't be chemistry. There wouldn't be anything. The universe as we know it just would not exist. So what do they do? They provide a, a different um, solution. They opt for a speculative approach known as the multiverse. And they imagine this, they have this kind of, there's this universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that odds are one life-permitting universe will eventually pop up, and we just happen to be in that life-permitting universe. However, now these are scientists that are proposing this, and it's really atheistic scientists that are proposing this. There's no scientific evidence for the existence of the multiverse. It can't be detected. It can't be observed. It can't be measured. It can't be proved. And what about the universe generator? That would need a lot of fine-tuning itself, wouldn't it? But actually, the universe generator sounds very much like the opening statement of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is the creator of the universe. And of course, people, um, astronomers, radio astronomers, they're not like the evolutionary biologists. They believe, they really do have faith, very many of them. And uh, this is what Arno Penzias says. He's a, a, a radio astronomer and a physicist. He says, astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. You know, this fine-tuned universe is evidence to me, again, convincing evidence that God exists. Finally, let's turn, uh, open our Bibles. Let's have a look at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. You know, um, I've, I've spent too long, so we'll, we'll, move on, um, we'll move on to this. The fact is that Jesus is a real historical figure. Um, there's so much evidence um, to prove that um, from the writings of these secular Roman writers. Um, they talk about Jesus being crucified, having followers who are called Christians. Um, you've even got the non-biblical witness of resurrection, which was the, um, the non-Christian writer, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian. In about 93, the year 93, he wrote this. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, man if it be lawful to call him a man. Um, he was the Christ. I'm looking at the middle bold text. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, because he was a Jew, um, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct to, the, extinct to this day. So Josephus talks about the uh, death, 
at the hands of Pontius Pilate and the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that he appeared to his followers. So what is the evidence that convinces me that Jesus was raised from the dead? The first of all you've, is the physical evidence. The tomb was empty. The Lord Jesus was crucified. He was buried in a tomb. But when the disciples went back to the tomb, the tomb was empty. They definitely found it empty. Not just them, but of course, the Jewish authorities as well. Um, the Jewish authorities, all they needed to do was say, well, you've got it wrong. You went to the wrong tomb. Here's the body. You, you know, you've made a mistake. But of course, they couldn't do that. So they said that um, the, the disciples had stolen the body. And we'll just address that later on. The people at Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, knew that the tomb was empty. As Peter preached to them in Jerusalem, which is obviously the tomb was only on the other side of the city walls. He preached to them that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And they all, 3,000 people believed on that day. So the people at Pentecost knew that the tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. That is a fact. So what happened to the body of the Lord Jesus? Well, he was raised because there were witnesses. You've got your Bibles open. Let's have a look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here the Apostle Paul is outlining the people who witnessed the resurrected Lord Jesus. We know, of course, he says he, in verse 4 that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Cephas, Peter, then by the twelve. Now, just remember what these apostles were like uh, before they had seen the resurrected Lord Jesus. They had been scattered. Um, they'd, some of them had looked at the crucifixion from afar. It was the women who had been obviously at the feet of the Lord Jesus at, during the crucifixion. But the rest of the disciples had been scattered. They were broken. They were lost. Their leader had left them. He'd been taken away. But 50 days after the crucifixion, and the resurrection, Peter was boldly preaching in the temple about the resurrection. He was a man who was completely changed, uh, and, and the rest of the apostles as well. Why? Because they had seen the resurrected Lord Jesus. Um, you have uh, the 500 people, look at verse 6, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. Paul is saying, you can go and see those, you can go and listen to and talk to those witnesses who, who, res, who saw the resurrected Lord Jesus. And then, of course, after that, he was seen by James. Now, James is, is recorded that he opposed the teaching of Jesus and the preaching of Jesus um, during Jesus's original ministry. James, of course, was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. But after after the crucifixion, James became the leader of the Jewish church in Jerusalem. Sorry, the leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem. So what caused the change? The obvious explanation is he saw the resurrected Lord Jesus. And, and, and Paul confirms this. And then, of course, the greatest witness for me is the man Saul of Tarsus. The man who said, um, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And we have a record of the fact that he had people beaten. He had people cast into prison. He went. He also caused the death of some believers um, in the Lord Jesus. And on that road to, Dam to Damascus, he literally saw the light, the light of the resurrected Lord Jesus. And at that moment, his life was changed because he realized the direction in which he had been going. And it had been totally the wrong way. The Lord Jesus was alive. So from going to persecuting the church, he now became the biggest advocate and evangelist spreading across the whole of the Western uh, Roman Empire. The fact that Jesus had been raised from the dead and he had witnessed this. He'd been the witness of Jesus, the resurrected Christ. And of course, that also explains this idea of why would they do, why would the disciples do this? You know, um, why would they steal the, the body of the Lord Jesus? That's manifestly not true because, of course, they were beaten, they were persecuted, they were tortured for their faith. 
but none of them recanted because they hadn't stolen the body of the Lord Jesus. They'd seen the resurrected Lord. So the resurrection of the Lord Jesus is a fact of history. It gives hope and confidence to us. We, it gives a confidence to us that there will be a resurrection, that he is the first fruits of uh, a, a body of faithful people who will also rise from the dead. His resurrection gives proof that he is the son of God. So here is my faith in God uh, based on evidence. So finally, perhaps you'd just like to turn to uh, Acts chapter 17. Of course, the Apostle Paul preached to the um, uni university, if you like, at Athens um, in Acts chapter 17. And he told them about God and what God's plan and purpose was. And he says in verse 24 of Acts 17, the God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. He's not worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God is our creator, says uh, the Apostle Paul. And he's got a purpose. Verse 26, he's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. In other words, God has a plan. He has a purpose with each individual on the in the world. And he's put us here in Coventry in 2024 for a purpose, a reason. It says that. In verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. God wants us to reach out to him and go along his path, to go his way, because we, in him we live and move and have our being. And he now, in the end of verse 30, he commands all men everywhere to repent. And of course, we know that repent means to turn around, to change direction, to turn towards God in contrition and to do what God wants us to do. And he's told us to repent because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he's ordained. And he's given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And just as Jesus has been raised from the dead, he will surely, certainly return, and the world will be judged in righteousness and justice by the Lord Jesus, the resurrected Son of God. So God has a plan and purpose. He is in control, and his plan will be worked out. Um, we've shown that faith and scientific method are compatible. We've, um, we've shown that the Bible and science answer different questions. We've shown that faith in God is not blind, it's based on evidence. Um, evolution doesn't explain the origin of life, it can't. Uh, we have also the fine-tuned universe and Jesus' resurrection. And of course, God's plan will be worked out. And we've got to make sure that each one of us plays an important part in that.